Today, we're greatly blessed to, to have a guest speaker. Actually, I don't consider him anymore a guest speaker. He has preached to us about four times. In fact, the first time he preached to us was downstairs when we were still using the uh, multipurpose hall. And of course, the reason why uh, I got to know this brother was because of the TEA program, the Expositors Academy program, wherein pastors and leaders are taught how to not only how to exegete, but how to preach from God's word verse by verse. And the pastors who have joined this program, including myself, have grown uh, in our understanding of scriptures. We have learned how to be able to communicate this to our people. And I'm really thankful for this brother. Him, together with uh, Pastor Vincent Green, have been, uh, uh, they have been teaching us. They've been mentoring us. They've been discipling us. And so I really thank God for this, this man. He has been a blessing to me. Uh, he is now one of my mentors, and I've grown so much under his teaching ministry. And very soon, and we have to congratulate him on this, he will receive his doctorate from Master's Seminary this coming May. So that's uh, seven days from now, he will be a doctor. So let's welcome in our midst Dr. Timothy Carnes. Let's give the Lord a big hand, please. Hello, maayong buntag. Good, good to be here this morning. Thank you, brother, for that very gracious introduction. It's been a wonder and a joy to not only be able to participate in learning how to study God's Word and preach it together, but just the relationships that we've been able to build as part of that program. And um, I'm looking forward to being here in the future, even though the uh, module, we have six modules, we finished the fifth one this week, and yes, your, your pastor is still passing, he's still doing well, um, but uh, we have uh, next time uh, in October, we'll be here for the sixth module and then graduation, and then Lord willing, a second batch will be starting, and so I'm so uh, joyful about that because that means I'll be allowed to come back and get to continue to fellowship with you. Um, it's just a wonder to, wonderful time to be here. and I do want to, if you don't mind, say hello to my parents, who I think are watching online, as well as my family. Uh, love you and looking forward to seeing you soon. Well, we've been uh, spending time together uh, singing to the Lord. That's part of worship. And this morning, we're going to talk about worship. And in fact, in this module that we just finished with the uh, Pastors and Expositors Academy, we've been looking at prophetic books. And so I thought it would be appropriate to look at a prophetic book from the Old Testament, one that specifically is addressing the issue of worship. Worship is such an important and uh, vital part of our life as a believer. And so we want to look at what is authentic worship? What does true worship look like? And to do that, we're going to see from the prophet Isaiah, in the very first chapter of Isaiah, what he has to say about this very important topic. But before we do that, let us ask the Lord uh, to bless our time as we look to his word. Father, we come before you um, asking, Lord, for you to open our hearts, to grant us by your spirit understanding of your truth and, Lord, a motivation to live it out and the grace, Lord, to live it out. Pr please, Lord, admonish where needed, encourage where needed, help where needed. We look to you and you alone. For in you we have life because of your son and what he has done. Thank you for him. We pray in his name. Amen. Now again, we are going to be looking at an Old Testament prophet. And oftentimes they are very direct in what they have to say. And so I, I think I should uh, sort of, you know, sometimes when you're watching a particular movie or video, you have a sort of a warning, uh, strong content. Well, I just want to be up front with you. This message has strong content content. The Lord is very direct here. And as we approach this text, what came to my mind as I was thinking about it was the fact that every person has regrets. Uh, we have maybe events, circumstances, situations, things we wish we hadn't done, things we wish we could take back. And that is not only true for individuals, but it is also true for nations. Nations have regrets. And certainly for my country, one of the greatest regrets the United States of America is 
the fact that we had slavery for several decades. Slavery is still being felt in America today. Its stain is deep and broad. One well-known slave whose name was Frederick Douglass, he was a, a slave who was able to escape to the north of the United States back in the 1840s. And he worked towards the abolition, the, this, the ending of slavery. He was a well-spoken man. He was very articulate, a good writer. And he wrote an autobiography about his experiences with slavery. In that autobiography, he described the, the horrors that he experienced. But he also described his love for Jesus Christ. He talked about his love for the Word of God and, and his faith and his connection to the Lord, his belief in the gospel. And so he struggled. He struggled with the world that he saw as he experienced in slavery and then the world that he saw in regards to what Christianity, true Christianity is according to Scripture. I wanted to read to you a couple of paragraphs from what he wrote. I think it will give great insight into what his, he experienced. He said, Of all slaveholders with whom I have ever met, the religious slaveholders are the worst. I have ever found them the meanest and basest, the most cruel and cowardly of all others. Between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference. I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slave-holding, women-whipping, partial, and hypocritical Christianity of this land. The man who wields the blood-stained leather whip during the week fills the pulpit on Sunday and claims to be a minister of the meek and lowly Jesus. The man who robs me of my earnings at the end of the week meets me as a class leader on Sunday morning to show me the way of life and the path of salvation. He who sells my sister for the purposes of prostitution stands forth as the pious advocate of purity. He who proclaims it a religious duty to read the Bible denies me the right of learning to read the name of of the God who made me. What Frederick Douglass experienced is without a doubt the height of hypocrisy, the height of hypocritical worship. Worship which shows a supposed love for God during Sunday, but then a very different picture during the week. The things that he saw, the things that he experienced as he was worshiping and singing with others on Sunday morning and then the pastor would come to the pulpit to preach, and that would be the very one that he observed during their week committing horrible atrocities to another human being. And he struggled with that hypocrisy. He struggled with that difference. And before we say, well, that, that is something that is confined to the United States 150 years ago. That is something that, that I would never do, something that I would never participate in. Before we say that, we need to remember the words of Christ in the Sermon on the Mount who said, if we are angry in our heart towards another, that is as the sin of murder. Or if we lust after another person, to God that is a sin of, as a sin of adultery. Jesus reminds us in the Sermon on the Mount that the seeds of the very atrocities that Frederick Douglass witnessed, the seeds of those atrocities are found in every human heart. Douglass was right when he observed that the authenticity, the realness, the genuineness of what a person looked like on Sundays was not to be confused with the rest of the week. He linked Sunday mornings with the rest of the week. What we are like, not just when we are here, is directly connected to what we are like outside of this room. And this issue of authentic worship was also a problem for the people of Isaiah's day. It was an issue then, and Isaiah in his very first message addresses this particular issue because the things that he observed, the things that he saw, were much like those that D Frederick Douglass observed in his life. And as we begin to look at this first sermon in Isaiah chapter 1, it's important to recognize that these were a people who were offering worship to God. These were a people who were coming consistently to the temple, offering sacrifices, frequently giving prayers to the Lord, constantly attending the services, if you will. But the problem was this. Their worship wasn't genuine. Their worship wasn't real. They were just going through the motions of worship, but not the reality of worship. And from Isaiah's message to the people of Israel, we're going to see this morning three steps towards a life of authentic worship. Three steps towards a life of authentic 
worship. And the first step is this. Recognize God's attitude towards hypocritical worship. We need to recognize, to understand, to see what God's attitude is toward hypocritical worship. And to see that, let us look at verses 10 through 15 in Isaiah chapter 1. Here the Lord says this, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the, the, excuse me, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They've become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. That's strong language. This is from our God speaking to His people. He is pretty clear about how He feels regarding their form of worship. And notice how He refers at the very beginning, He refers to Israel as Sodom and Gomorrah. What are those places known for? They certainly were not high on God's five top places to visit list. In fact, they represented the the height of wickedness, so much so that God destroyed them. He wiped them from the face of the earth. And yet here, he is addressing his people as those two places. Very strong language. God begins his indictment of Israel's worship in verse 11 with this question, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me? And then describes those many sacrifices that they were offering. The issue here wasn't that they were bringing the wrong offerings. And the problem here was not that they weren't bringing enough of them. In fact, notice he says multiplied sacrifices they were bringing. And then he says, I'm full of them. I've, I've had enough. He's saying, I'm stuffed. Busoka ayo. Busoka ayo oi. He was stuffed with them. And then in verse 12, he describes their, their coming to him like, was like a trampling of his courts. The, the idea there was that they're just coming along, bringing dirt in, bringing these dirty animals in. And they were unwelcome. He said, why are you coming here, making a mess of my place? You're not welcome here. Not only was he sickened by their animal sacrifices, he says also he abhorred their grain offerings. Look at verse 13 where he says, Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. Now the things he mentions here are things that he described in Leviticus chapter 2 as part of what he desired for his people to, to participate in in worship, to, to celebrate the Sabbath, to celebrate the new moons, to bring incense, to burn toward, for him as an act of worship and adoration. He speaks of these regular times of the feast which God Himself had put in place for them to be a part of. But notice what He says here. I can't endure them any longer. They're, They're loathsome to me. He describes them as iniquitous assemblies, sin fests. And notice in verse 14, God's intensity increases even more. He says there, I hate your new moon festivals, your appointed feasts. They've become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. The Hebrew here is very strong. Where it says I hate, he literally says my soul hates. It's the idea of down to the depth of my being, to the core of who I am, I hate your festivals. I detest them. They only weary me. They bring no delight. Now we need to stop here for a moment and just reflect on what he's saying here. This is stunning language. This is, this is at the time they were gathering together, much like a, a service together. And imagine if Pastor Mel came up and spoke these words to us. We would be overwhelmed. For him to say that he hates what they are doing to the core of his being and his disgust did not stop just with the animal sacrifices. He he did not only abhor their grain offerings, he was not only sickened by their festivals, 
But perhaps the most devastating thing of all is what he says in verse 15. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. God's giving the picture here of the the worshiper who is coming before him and, and during the sacrifice lifts their hands to ask God to receive that sacrifice. And what does God say? He is so disgusted by what he is observing, he puts his hand out and says, I'm not even looking. I'm ignoring you. I'm not listening. This is devastating language. Even though the people were offering continual prayer. Again, it wasn't as if they were only rarely coming to offer worship. It was a frequent activity. But what could be more crushing than to hear God say, I'm not listening to you. God's rejection here is personal. Now the biggest question that we should have in our minds as we're hearing this strong and, and, and harsh language from the Lord is what brought this about? Why is God so angry? Why would he get to the point where he says, I hate what is going on here to the core of my being. I'm not listening. Well, we find at the end of verse 15 in one short phrase where he says this, Look at the end there, verse 15. Your hands are covered with blood. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, here in this picture, as he's talking about uh, worship and bringing of sacrifices, the the image that would come into the minds of those hearing would be the fact that when, uh, when you would go to offer sacrifice to the Lord, an animal sacrifice in particular, and as you would approach the the tabernacle, the temple, There would be two courts. There was the inner court called the court of the priests where the Holy of Holies, uh, the holy place was. It had the Ark of the Covenant inside of it. And the altar would be out in front of that holy place. And you as the sacrificer would come, you would wait in the outer courts until it was your turn. And then you, if you were the head of the household, you would bring that sacrifice in with you. And you would meet the priest at the altar and then you would be the one to kill that sacrifice. The priest did not kill the sacrifice. He merely took the blood and spread it on the altar and and offered it up on the sacrificer's behalf. But you, as the sinner, would be the one to slit the throat of the animal. Now, I grew up, my grandparents and my grandfather raised cattle. And I had opportunity at times to participate when they would butcher an animal. And after they would um, kill the animal, then you would have to slit its throat to empty out the blood. And I told you this would be a, a strong content message. But I remember as a young boy being participating in that. And after cutting the animal's throat, blood is everywhere. And it gets all over your hands. It gets all over the ground. It's everywhere. And this would be the picture in the scene that would be in the minds of the Israelites. As the person coming in to offer the sacrifice slits the throat of the animal, blood is all over the person's hands. And as he lifts them to heaven asking God to accept the sacrifice... Guess what will be dripping down his arms? The blood of that sacrifice. And so here it would appear God is referring to that very thing. Your hands are covered with blood. But the thing is, God was not speaking about the animal's blood that would be dripping from their hands. What God was talking about here was human blood. Because the word for blood here in the original Hebrew has primarily the idea of bloodshed against another human being. It can represent violence or oppression, the things that they were, the ways they were sinning against one another. And so you see these so-called worshipers as they were coming together to offer sacrifice and they lift their hands up. God's saying, I've seen all you did during the week. I know how you treated that particular person a few days ago. I saw what you did. Your hands are covered with human blood. These so-called worshipers were engaged in a life of sinful cruelty against their neighbors. What God saw is exactly what Frederick Douglass observed in his experiences. Isaiah, later on in the book, describes the particular sins that they were committing to one, against one another. In verses 16 and 17 of this chapter, he talks about the fact that they were oppressing the widow and the orphan. Chapter 5, he talks about the injustices that were being carried out, the bloodshed that was taking place, murder and violence being committed against others. In verse chapter 5, he also talks about the, the bribery 
They deprive the needy. They rob the poor in chapter 10. In fact, in Amos, we are given a a particular description of a situation that was taking place where uh, if you were a poor person in the land of Israel and you needed to borrow money, you would go to your brother, they would lend you the money, and then you would give them your cloak or blanket as a pledge that you would pay it back. But God said, if the person is so poor that they have no other clothing, then you don't take that pledge for them, from them. Let them keep their blanket. But you see, what was happening in Israel's, in Isaiah's day was that not only would they keep the blanket, but then they would go down and use that blanket to sit on during worship services at the temple. God was disgusted by that. Isaiah summarizes it later in in chapter 59 when he says these words, Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you, so that He does not hear. Your hands are defiled with blood, there's the imagery again, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken falsehood, your tongue mutters wickedness. So another way he describes how they were sinning against one another was was slander and lying, evil speech. Their hands were defiled with blood. What they were doing was, on the one side, they would appear as they came before him to offer worship, that they were fulfilling the greatest commandment in Scripture to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But then at the very same time, on the other hand, during the week, they were butchering the second commandment, which says you shall love your neighbor as yourself. They're interconnected. You can't separate them. You can't have love for God on one hand and hatred for your brother or sister on another. In fact, this is exactly what John the Apostle said in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, when he said, if someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. They're interconnected. And we see here, God's not interested in external expressions of religion. He's not interested in worship that is being offered at one time while at the same time oppressing others, oppressing the poor, not caring for the needy, tolerating or committing injustice, committing immorality on a consistent basis, sinning against one's spouse, sinning against one's neighbor, spreading lies, gossip, bitterness. You know, we seem to think at times that God is is not very smart, or that he doesn't see everything. That You know what? He only has his eyes open when we gather together on a Sunday morning. But the rest of the week, he has no idea what's going on. We seem to live that way at times. But yet we all know that the eye of the Lord is moving and sees everything, doesn't he? Even more than what is on the outside, he also sees what's in our hearts. And he saw what these people were doing. What they were doing during the week rendered their worship as false, hypocritical. It wasn't true. It wasn't authentic. It wasn't real. It wasn't genuine. And God knew it. All the externals were there. Again, they followed the prescribed laws. They gave the sacrifices as required. They came together during the festivals and the Sabbaths as God had told them to do. They participated in all the activities God said For them to participate in. But the problem was this. God didn't have their hearts. Isaiah later says in chapter 29 in verse 13. This people honors me with their lips. But their hearts are far from me. I seem to remember Jesus quoting that. Very same text. Worship from the heart as expressed in a holy life. Has been what God has always wanted from his people. In Deuteronomy 10 verse 12. It says, Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways and love Him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Hosea 6.6, 6, God said, I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice, and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. You see, the problem with the people in Isaiah's day is this. They did not understand That worship is more than an event. It's a way of life. Worship is not an event. It's a way of life. It's a lifestyle. Because God wants 
righteousness, not religion. He wants what is real, not ritual. He wants faithfulness, not fakeness. He wants integrity, not insincerity. He wants honesty, not hypocrisy. And if God's extreme reaction here in Isaiah chapter 1 shows us anything, it shows us how strong his attitude is towards hypocritical worship. Anyone who would offer service to God while at the same time harboring a sinful lifestyle only brings God's disgust and a deaf ear. One preacher said this, I believe it was Martin Lloyd-Jones, who said, I, I believe God would rather have five minutes of true worship than five hours of phony religion. I would say five seconds of true worship. And brothers and sisters, I am persuaded, please listen to me, I am persuaded that there are many, many people in churches all over the world, perhaps even some in this room, who are just going through the motions like those 7th century Israelites. That they do what they think God expects of them. They show up faithfully at Sunday morning service, uh, perhaps even during the week going to Bible studies or singing with the congregation, uh, reading the scriptures, perhaps on a regular basis, attending prayer meetings. But listen, if, if life outside of those times of, of worship is characterized by sin, if there is little love being shown towards others, if one is taking advantage of other people, if your heart is empty of true love for Christ, if God is absent from your day-to-day -day life, if you're regularly disobeying Him with little guilt, then if, can I be direct with you? Your worship is meaningless. It's hypocritical. It's like the prideful Sunday school teacher who was trying to impress upon his class the, the importance of living the Christian life. And so he asked his students, the young boys in his class, he says, why do people call me a Christian? And one boy said, maybe that's because they don't know you. Painful but true. And though this text here in Isaiah 1 was primarily directed to non-believing Israelites... We need to take the principles here and consider them very seriously. We need to be very careful about offering hypocritical worship. Because remember what Jesus said again in the Sermon on the Mount when he talked about if, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, what did Jesus say to do? Go ahead and offer anyway because that's all I care about. I just want you to do these duties. I don't care about your heart. I don't care about your, what you're doing with other people during the week. Is that what Jesus said? He said, no, leave it there. Go make things right with your brother and then offer that sacrifice. Come and present your offering. And we cannot miss what Jesus is saying here. He's saying here how we treat others is directly connected to our worship of God. Just as it was in the days of Isaiah. We cannot live one way for part of the time, and another for the rest of the time, and think God is okay with that. He's not. I can remember when my kids were younger, most of them are grown now, but when they were younger, there would be times on perhaps a Sunday morning or even on a Wednesday night as we we're going to youth group where my kids would get into an argument or a fight and they would be sinning against one another. And you know, we didn't just keep going and show up at church and pretend like nothing happened. I would take those children aside and we would work through and deal with the issue. And sometimes we would even miss Sunday morning service altogether. Because I did not want my children to think that they could sin in the way they were sinning against their brother or sister and then come and offer praises to God just a few minutes later. Oh, Lord, I thank you for, this is a wonderful, I hate you. Oh, praise the Lord, praise Jesus, hallelujah, I'm going to get you later. Oh, God, you're so good, I'm really going to figure out a way to hurt you. God <laughs> will not tolerate that. That's complete hypocrisy, and I did not want my children growing up thinking that was okay. Because it's not. And it's the same for all of us. It's the same for all of us. If you have an ongoing conflict with somebody else, if you know of someone else who has an issue with you, if, 
If you're having problems with a, a, your spouse or your children or a neighbor or someone else here, a fellow brother or sister, you need to deal with it before you offer any form of worship. Isn't that what Jesus directly said? Leave your offering there and go make it right. He couldn't be more clear. We need to be so careful here. Again, remember, worship is more than an event. It's a way of life. Well, that is the first step towards a life of authentic worship, and it is to recognize God's attitude towards hypocritical worship. The second step is to repent from that hypocritical worship, and we see this in verses 16 to 18. We're back in Isaiah chapter 1. Take a look at verse 16 where Isaiah gives the response to their hypocrisy. He says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from my sight, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Here basically we see Isaiah calling them to repentance, and he does so by giving them nine short direct commands. The first four commands in verse 16 describe this flee from sinful behavior, cease to do evil. And then verse 17, he describes five commands of what they're to pursue. Pursue righteous living, righteous behavior. He's calling them here to repent. Notice here, a change in lifestyles being demanded. It's not just simply perform the occasional good deed. It's to, to behave or act as a way of life. And God tells them how. And one of the ways, notice he says, seek justice Reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, and plead for the widow. That reminds me of what James said in James chapter 1, verse 27, when he said, Pure and undefiled religion is this in the sight of our God. We could say, true worship is this in the sight of our God. That is to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Sounds a lot like Isaiah, doesn't it? Brothers and sisters, we would do well to evaluate the true level of our own worship by how we treat those and how we show love to others who cannot repay. In fact, the most telling sign of a, of a person, of a, of a church, of a society, is how they treat those from whom they will receive no compensation, no benefit, no repayment, no advantage. And so as we think about this, brothers and sisters, I would just ask you, I would ask you this question. Are you a true worshiper? Are you a true worshiper? If how you live outside of these walls is the opposite of what you look like inside of them, then this message is aimed directly at you. You need to recognize God's attitude towards that form of worship. How do you treat others? Again, ask yourself, am I a true worshiper? It reminds me of the words of Thomas Watson who said this, What good will it do a man when he is in hell that others think he's gone to heaven? That's a profound statement. Because we so often worry about what other people think about us. I want to look good in front of others. I want to look spiritual and holy and dedicated to the Lord. But Watson says, what good will that do you? If a man or a woman, when he or she is in hell, that others think he's gone to heaven. We must stop external religion and come broken before God. That's what David said in Psalm 51. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. This is not the end of the story, though. By simply desiring to turn from evil deeds and do what is right, that still doesn't repair the damage, the sin that we've already committed. Again, Isaiah 59, 2 said that our iniquities have created a separation between the sinner and God. A repentant heart is necessary. A repentant heart is required, but it's not sufficient to be made right with God. Ultimately, that sin needs to be dealt with. That sin needs to be forgiven, right? The blood on our hands needs to be washed off. And only God can do that. And that's what we see in verse 18. Isaiah has an incredible offer given to them from the Lord. Notice there in verse 18. 
Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. That first statement there, come and let us reason together, has the idea of its courtroom terminology. I I didn't read the first nine verses of the sermon, but what they do is set up a courtroom scene where God is the prosecutor and the people of Israel are are, are the defendants on the stand and witnesses are the creation. And here now God comes back to this idea of the courtroom scenario and He says this, let's settle our differences. Let us debate our case in court so that we can come to an agreement. And He offers a proposal here. And it's an amazing proposal. Because He says, though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Now that translation makes it sound like it's a guaranteed promise that they will be white as snow, that they will be like wool. But here in the original Hebrew, the idea is they may become, they can become as white as snow or or like wool. It's an offer being made. It's conditional. Your sins can be forgiven if you seek that forgiveness. Forgiveness is never extended without true repentance, right? And I, as I think about this offer, here God, what has He just been saying to them? How much is my soul hates basically your worship, He said. It disgusts me. I'm not listening. And then in the next breath, He says, but I'm willing to forgive. And I'm willing to forgive to such an extent I will remove that sin completely, that, that human blood, that, the stain that's dripping from your hands, I will make your hands as clean as if it had never been there. He talks about White as snow. Now, I figure probably here in Cebu, you probably don't get a lot of snow. I've had the opportunity to live in part of the United States where we would get snow during the winters. And and times after a, a large snow, there'd be a thick pile of it on the ground and everything is white. It is an amazing picture. And that's the picture here. That those deep stains of blood, of sin that are on our hands can be wiped away and erased as if they were never there. Isn't that what we sang earlier? Your blood erases my sin. He doesn't just draw a line through our sins. He completely removes it as if it never occurred. Jesus Christ took on Himself the sins of all who put their trust in Him. Never to be brought up again. God's not going to hold up a a sheet that has stamped forgiven on it, but still all your sins are written there. The sheet that he holds up is going to be completely blank. Gone, erased, forgiven, never to be brought up again. You won't have to answer for those if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you put your trust in him. That's an amazing offer because we're all hypocritical worshipers. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all rebelled against Him. We all deserve Him to say, I'm not listening, and to judge us in hell for eternity. We all deserve that. Every one of us. Myself especially. And yet here, verse 18, is the offer. Come let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, they can become, they can be made as white as snow. The healing balm of God's mercy is so amazing. Now the question is this. It's wonderful God offers this forgiveness. If we would repent and put our trust in Christ, that forgiveness is extended. But the, the question is this. How can God forgive that sin? Isn't He just? Well, Isaiah 53 explains exactly how. And that is because that sin and the punishment that it deserves was placed on someone else. Isaiah 53, let me just remind you of some of the things it says. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Him. The righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as He will bear their iniquities. He poured out Himself to death. He Himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Who's Isaiah talking about here? Who is he foretelling? Jesus Christ. God's servant who would take upon himself the sin of the many, who would be tortured and beaten and blasphemed and killed. Why? Because he deserved it? 
No, because you and I did. Through him, our sins can be forgiven. Through him, we can be made right with God. Through him, the crimson blood that was flowing on the cross can take away our crimson stain of sin as if it was never there. And not only is this the message we must believe, but it is a message you and I must take to a world that is caught up in external religion. It's a message that you and I must take to a world that thinks the answer to the problems of sin and evil is human effort. That I can earn my way to be right with God. This message must be declared to a world that is looking for the answer in everything else but Jesus Christ. And we have the answer, do we not? God tells us in His Word how those who are caught up in a life of sin can be forgiven. Now here in Isaiah, his sermon that he delivered some 2,700 years ago still applies to us today because God still desires authentic worship, doesn't He? And no matter how long you've been coming to church, no matter how long you've been a Christian, no matter how many sermons you've heard, no matter how many Bible studies you've participated in, no matter how many IBI classes you have taken and passed, no matter how many ministries you served in, no matter how many verses you memorized, we too are in danger of becoming cold towards God if we're not careful. We too are in danger of acting one way when we're around each other and quite another when we're apart from each other. We too are in danger of hypocritical worship. Again, does your heart and life here on Sunday mornings, does that, what everyone sees here, does it look the same at home? What would your family say? Would your child, as he's here, look at you? Daddy doesn't act like that at home. Or Mommy, why are you so nice to people here? You're not like that at home. What would our family say? Well, so far we've looked at two steps towards a life of authentic worship. And that is first, to recognize God's attitude towards hypocritical worship. And secondly, to repent from that hypocritical worship. The third step, it's implied in Isaiah's message, and it is simply this. Pursue a life of authentic worship. And here, just briefly to cover this last point, I'd like to take us to a couple of passages in the New Testament, ones that I think are familiar. The first is in John 4, 23, where the subject of worship came up as Jesus was discussing with the woman at the well. And he says in verse 23 these words, An hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must Worship Him in spirit and truth. Here Christ defines what true worship looks like. Here He tells us this is genuine worship. And that is to worship God in spirit and truth. And I take spirit there to have this idea of a genuine, heartfelt passion for God as moved and empowered by work of the Spirit in the heart of a believer. There can be no ulterior motive, no sinful life, that's being entertained. Worshiping God in spirit is worshiping Him with a passion, a desire to know Him. I, I love how David described it in Psalm 27, verse 4. I think this is the picture of what it looks like to worship Him in spirit when he said this, One thing I've asked of the Lord, and that I will seek after. One thing, David says, this is one thing that I want. And what is that one thing, David? To dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. That's the only place I want to be. That's the only wish that I have, Lord. Now, why is that, David? Why do you want to dwell in the temple of the house of the Lord? Is it because it's a nice, comfortable, safe place? Is it because you won't have to deal with all the struggles and hassles of life? Certainly that would be a part. But notice what David says. The one thing I ask and desire and seek from you, God, is to dwell in your house forever, for all the days of my life. Why? To behold the beauty of the Lord. I just want to look at you. I just want to be with you and to meditate in his temple. Meditate on what? Meditate on God. This is the heart of a genuine worshiper. There's only one thing that you would want, and that is to be captivated by the majesty of Christ. 
Is that you? Is that me? We need to be looking to God's face, John Piper says, not his hand. We need to be looking towards the one who is the giver of blessing, not just the blessings that he gives. I like how John Piper also said, worship is not a means to an end. Worship is an end. It is the goal. It is the purpose. This is the heart of authentic worship. It simply says, I want God. I want to know him. That's all I want. May that be the cry of our hearts. Amen? Now, worship to worship true worshipers, worship God not only in spirit, but also in truth. That's what Jesus said in John 4. We base, our worship is based on what is true. Some believe just that gathering to sing and, and gathering to pray and, and doing things for God, that that's all that he's concerned about. But Jesus says our worship must be based on what we know to be true about God. And true about what he has said to us. Psalm 145, 18 says, The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. And that's why we need to, to continually be spending time in his word. We need to continually be hearing sermons from his word, reading the Bible, memorizing it, meditating upon it, listening to messages, reading books that explain it. Let the word of Christ richly dwell in us. Because we cannot be a true worshiper, an authentic worshiper of the true God if we do not know the truth about God. So pursue a life of authentic worship. One that is worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. And then thirdly and lastly, Romans 12 gives us a third way to pursue that authentic worship. And that is in ongoing Sacrifice of ourselves. An ongoing life of obedience and service. In response to God's saving work in the first 11 chapters of Romans, Paul then says, we are to respond in this way as he says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, the, His works and salvation, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Notice there, the living and holy sacrifice in the same sentence as worship. And here, what is the sacrifice? Or should I say, who is the sacrifice? It's not an animal this time, is it? It's us. And who is the one being sacrificed to? It's God, right? Now here, we need to get something straight. The sacrifice doesn't get to choose what it wants. It's not like we can wander in and say, you know, I like that patch of grass over there. I, that altar scares me, but, but you know, I'd love to just eat over there. Can I just be over there? We don't get to choose how God wants to use the sacrifice. The focus is on the one receiving that sacrifice. The focus is on Him. Authentic worship is the giving over of one's self to be conformed to what God wants, not to what we want. I heard one preacher say one time, you know, we're not very good sacrifices. We keep trying to climb off the altar. Daniel Block says in his book, For the Glory of God, true worship is essentially the human response to the divine creator and redeemer. For this reason, the goal of authentic worship is the glory of God rather than the pleasure of human beings. The goal of authentic worship is the glory of God, the one being sacrificed to, not the pleasure of human beings. But you know the wonderful and great thing about it is that is, as the glory of God is our desire and is our passion and is our goal, then we find the greatest pleasure in Him. Brother Augie quoted Psalm 16 earlier. In His right hand are pleasures forever. And those pleasures can only be found as our lives are dedicated for God's glory. To be used in service however He would use us. With a passion to know Him. A desire to, to be with Him. A desire to, to spend time to understand Him more. To love Him more. As He truly is. True worship is so much more than attending a church service or gathering together, isn't it? Again, worship is is true worship is a lifestyle, not an event. It's a lifestyle, not an event. I remember the story of a believer 
brother in Christ in China, I, I don't recall his name, he lived about 100 years ago, and he had this great compassion for his countrymen because many of his countrymen were being taken to South Africa as slaves to work in the gold mines. Harsh, horrible conditions, little wages, they were isolated from the population, and this man was so burdened for them, especially their need for Christ, that he sold himself into slavery to go work in those gold mines. He only survived about five years under those conditions, but in that time period, he led 200 men to the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, I submit to you, that is the heart of authentic worship. Now that doesn't mean you have to be a missionary in a distant or remote land or that you need to sell yourself into slavery or, or get yourself into prison so you can have a prison ministry necessarily. If God wants you in a prison, He'll figure out a way to get you there. But what I'm saying is this. As our Chinese brother showed us, it's a commitment to be used by God in whatever way He desires to use us for His glory so that His Son would be lifted up so that He would be made known. That is a life of authentic worship, to be a living sacrifice for God's honor and glory. Again, authentic worship is not an event. It's a way of life. Let's pray. Oh Lord, uh, these are strong words and sobering words. Lord, what you said to your people through Isaiah... Lord, they are hard words to hear, but we thank you for them because in them we see just how you feel about hypocrisy, that we would feign a love for you on the one hand and, and then to, to sin against others and against you on the other on a regular basis, that, that God, that is something you loathe. Oh, Lord, make us those who are not such a people. I pray especially, Lord, for any here this morning who, who are caught up in a life of hypocritical worship or are caught up in a life of sin against you and they need your forgiveness. May you in this moment by your Spirit open their eyes so that they would come to Christ, that they would desire to know Him and be right with Him so that their sins may be forgiven and washed as white as snow. And Lord, I pray... For us who do know you, and perhaps some who are struggling here, and uh, particular sins that they are involved in during the week, and just, Lord, maybe not realizing that, Lord, coming here on a Sunday morning, it does not remove the fact that those sins have been committed. Just, Lord, I pray you would draw them near to you, that they would make things right with you, confess those sins, take steps to change. Lord, I pray that. My brothers and sisters here, it's this wonderful church, Lord, that they would be a light to this community, that the community would, would look at them and see what true worshipers look like and see what authentic, an authentic passion for God is and how they treat one another and how they live their lives. Let us, Lord, be a light to a lost world. For the sake of your Son, and in his name we pray, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. That was a sobering message, and it's a message that you and I need to hear over and over again, because sometimes we do forget who we are, and we forget that Christ has redeemed us for himself. And sometimes we do live for ourselves, forgetting that we've been purchased by His priceless blood. And so we thank God for the very powerful reminder this uh, morning. And I trust that the Word of God will not return to Him null and void, but it will accomplish the very purpose by which He has sent it for us. And so we thank God for, for that message this morning. Amen? Were you blessed? Let's give the Lord a big hand, please.
Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, oh God, thank you for your word. Your word is like water. It cleanses and washes us, oh God. And we thank you, oh God, that you have reminded us once again that worship is not an event, it is a lifestyle. And Lord, we pray that every single day of our existence would be devoted to the worship of God. And may we not just worship in songs, but may we worship applying the Word of God in our lives. Lord, we are the fifth gospel. We are the gospel that some people read. And we pray, O oh God, that we might have good testimonies to bring honor and glory to your name. We pray, O oh Lord, Lord God, that you might continue to move in the power of your Holy Spirit, changing and molding us and conforming us to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you also for the opportunity to worship you through tithes, grace, gifts, and offerings, Lord. Lord, we pray that you might use them for the glory of your name. And Lord, would you be so kind to bless us, not because we're greedy, not because we desire more, but because we want to be a blessing that we might be used in partnering with you in glorifying your name and extending your kingdom. We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen.